have been called by God and we've been chosen for this hour. We are no better than anyone else. We're no better than any other denomination except we have been called by his name. If someone say amen on that. It's because he's holy that he can maintain the right and privilege to continue to be God. And because he's holy, when we get in those situations we talked about a little while ago, he's able to be exactly what needs to fit in your situation. Because there is no unrighteousness in him. There is no sin in him. And because there is no sin in him, there is no sickness in him. Because there is no sin, no unholiness in him. There is no failing to his character, his nature, and his power. Therefore, he can always be everything that we need him to be. So this series is talking about the journey home, how we get back to what God wants us to be. So why don't you just put your Bibles down. Let's have a word of prayer. Now, when I say a word of prayer tonight, I'm just, this is not going to be just a typical prayer over the word or prayer over the message. But I'd like to ask you to just take some time right now. Let's just pray. Let's ask God to open up our hearts, open up his, and let him plant a seed in us right now, begin to minister to our spirit. Why don't you just pray together? Lord, we magnify you. We thank you right now. We come to you tonight in trust and faith. We lift up our hearts. We lift up our, our minds to you right now and ask you just to begin to speak. Lord, help us, Lord, to go beyond not just the distractions of the week and the day, but, Lord, help us to go beyond this the social, cultural thinking that has been placed in our minds in this society that we've lived in. Lord, help us to look beyond this world and see the world that you have prepared for us. Help us to see, God, the lifestyle you have chosen for us. Help us, Lord, to hunger after your holiness. Help us, Lord, to find the blessing, Lord, that comes from hungering after your holiness and your presence and, and a desire to conform our lives every day more and more to how you would like us to live. I pray, Lord, that you would dash all superstitions. I pray that you would come against all obstacles. I pray that every hardened heart would be softened. I pray that every unanswered question would be answered. I pray that every confusion would be straightened out, Lord, and that you would give us a genuine perspective of what you have for us in holiness. We love you. In your precious name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Why don't you just clap your hands and shout unto him tonight. We love you, Lord. We love you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen. God bless you tonight as you're seated. We closed last week talking about the terms positional sanctification and experiential sanctification. And in review, positional sanctification is a sanctification and salvation based upon, upon one's position in Christ. This is an extension of God's mercy and grace, enabling someone to be saved should they, should they meet with judgment soon after receiving the Holy Ghost, should they meet their end on this world soon after having received the gift of the Holy Ghost, and being baptized in Jesus' name, should they meet their maker, so to speak, in a period of time that is so soon after receiving his gift of his spirit, his salvation, before they have had time to conform their life, before they've had time to develop a holiness lifestyle, before they've had time to glean the knowledge from his word to develop a lifestyle that comes in living for God. That person can be saved due to this positional sanctification. It is an act of the mercy of God, and we should be thankful for it. It is, is an extension of his great grace and his knowledge in the world and, and situations that can happen. Now, experiential salvation is sanctification that is based upon one's experience with God. It is one's actual holiness of life, and as your experience with God develops, your accountability and responsibility develops as well. We would not require a toddler to do chores around the house, would we? But a teenager 
need to start doing some work and taking on their full portion. Amen. Teenagers say amen. Oh, that was weak right there. Y'all going to cause me to take this jacket off here tonight and start to preaching in here, show y'all how much weight I've gained on all that food y'all been bringing to the house. My goodness. But as you grow older, more is required of you. Is that right? Well, last week I sensed a little disagreement and and confusion, maybe not so much disagreement, but I sensed an air of confusion on why I was going into this subject, so let me just elaborate here briefly. Why did I spend time in the introduction last week talking about these two points? Number one, the church needs to understand that it is imperative that we do not discourage new Christians by pressuring them into standards of holiness that they do not yet understand simply as a rite of passage. No one ever needs to come to a church and simply adopt the holiness standards just to feel like they can become a member or they can become a part. When that happens, we place them in danger. They have been saved when they received the Holy Ghost and and were baptized in Jesus' name. And God will be the judge of what they are accountable for based on their position in him, which is not something that most of us can really speculate on. Amen? So we need not be so quick to crack eggs that are not ready to hatch yet. We need not be so quick to jump in and break up things that are not ready. We talk about the new birth experience. You hear about that a lot in the church. We talk about that. But we must be careful that as the church, we do not become guilty of partial birth abortions. A partial birth abortion is when a birth has begun and then the baby is killed. Church, the goal is that we get people to heaven. Amen? Just putting a ticket to heaven in their hand does not get them to heaven. They've got to get on the train. They've got to live the life. They've got to make it, so to speak. The race isn't given to the swift. The race is given to those that endure to the end. And if we come in in the moment when they are at their very weakest, in the moment when they are a new child in Christ, and we begin to add weight on them that they're not ready to handle, we can become guilty of pushing them out of the kingdom of God. Amen. We should encourage people in their development with God because the more they learn of him and the more they experience of him, the more he will compel them to make changes in their life that please him. Now, we can never do for a person what God can do. We are never going to be able to put conviction in someone's heart like God is going to be able to put conviction in somebody's heart. I have listened to preaching all my life. I've heard good preaching, and I've heard my fair share of bad preaching, and I've heard a lot of it that was middle of the road. But if all we can do as preachers is preach conviction, 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 then we're trying to take over somebody else's job. Now, none of this is meant that, to say that we shouldn't do that. There's a thing called balance that we all need in our Christian life. But when it comes to conviction, true conviction comes from God. And God should direct our pastors and leaders on how to funnel that to the church, to the new believers, and how to bring that in to the church. So the pastor is the one who has the responsibility to step out there sometimes and, and, and create an exposure and be the one who says, Sir or ma'am, You're not living right. The pastor is the one who has to carry that responsibility. The pastor is the one whom God has ordained to carry that responsibility. So basically, it's kind of like this. I think I said it last week. We can't have so many chiefs that we don't have any Indians around here. Because if everybody's on the wall watching, nobody's in the church working. Amen? Amen? And there needs to be a governance in the house of God. We need to follow a certain governance because God has prepared a system in order for this to work. So we should encourage them to in their development with God because here, here's the situation. When changes are made in the right time, 
when changes are made as a person matures naturally in God, I mean that naturally in both weights of it, meaning that people should not mature too slowly and people should not mature too quickly because there's dangers either way. But when people do mature naturally in God, the changes that they make are rarely undone. When somebody is maturing naturally in God, whatever decision they make in their life that is a change to conform, to get rid of something that is not pleasing to God in their life, that change that they make because they have found it and decided on that at a proper maturing time in their Christian walk, they own that decision. And they rarely will undo that decision. You might have similar experience with these kind of things because you've had things in your life that you've done only because somebody in a supervisory position told you you had to do it. And just as soon as they were out of your life, you quit doing it, didn't you? You got things on your job that you have to do that you don't even agree with. But you do it because somebody said you had to do it. And as soon as that boss walks off the job, as soon as that CEO gets transferred to another unit, you're going to stop doing that so quick. You're never going to go back doing it. Because your only reason for doing it is because of your supervisor authority. But when your supervisor is Jesus Christ first, then you're going to have a reason to do things that goes beyond all these little complications we have on this earth. Somebody say amen. amen. Remember, receiving the Holy Ghost is a beginning. Everybody say a beginning. Amen. And holiness is a process. God has called us to make disciples. God did not call us just to pray people through at altars and kick them out of the nest. God has not called us just to pray people through and just let them go out into the world. God has called us to make disciples. He said, go forth, teach all nations, and baptizing them. Mm, I just caught that. Did you, just catch, did you catch that? He didn't say baptize them, then teach them. He said, teach them and baptize them. You can baptize somebody into your holiness way of life, but if you don't teach them first, there's going to be a problem later on. Let me say it like this. When, when a, a professional swimmer is born, he goes to a nursery. When a champion high diver is born, he goes to a nursery. There are no maternity units on the beach. There's no maternity units out beside the Olympic pool. They might be a deep water diver or submariner when their time comes. But their process starts in the same place that every other human being starts. The same place as everyone else. Consider this thought. What would happen if a champion swimmer would be dropped into the deep water a day or a week or so after birth? What's that guy that won all those medals for us in the Olympics a couple years ago? Michael Phelps. When Michael Phelps was born, Brother Mack, if we took him to the deep end of that Olympic pool that he can get across so fast, and we just dropped him on in there, what do you think was going to happen? That champion swimmer-to-be was going to be dead, wasn't he? Because at the beginning of his process, he is not able to endure what is in that deep side of the pool. He would die. We as a church have to see things in this perspective. Every soul that is birthed into the kingdom of God has the potential to be a champion. Every single soul that we pray through at these altars has the potential to be the next Apostle Peter or the next Apostle Paul. Now, maybe you're not going to look at it that way. That's fine. You can continue to think that way, but I'm going to look at it that way. Because every soul has possibility. Every soul has potential. And you are only free from your responsibility to win the lost when you meet the person that Jesus did not die for. And that's not going to happen. Every soul has potential in Christ. We say it and we've, we've heard it. We sing the song, he saw not what I was, but he saw what I could be. So the thing with us is when we abort early, 
Not only do we lose the soul, Brother Moore, but we lose the potential. When that champion swimmer, as a newborn, is dropped into the deep end of the pool, we don't just lose his soul, we lose his potential to influence everyone he will come in contact with in his adult life. Now, this transfers directly into the kingdom of God because everyone has potential in God, and when we abort them early, everyone they're connected to, we lose the opportunity to network the Holy Ghost through them. Somebody say amen. amen. Now, most issues of holiness, moving on here, most issues of holiness are not salvation issues. They're Christian maturity or sanctification issues issues. And as you grow in God, he's going to require more of you. He's going to ask more of you. It's only as we do not obey God in these areas does our willful disobedience become a salvation issue. As you begin to mature in God, he begins to prompt you and convict you and ask you to do things to make changes. Then when you understand it and willfully disobey it, that's when it becomes a salvation issue for you. Because as my grandfather was famous for saying, there's only one sin. There only ever has been one sin, and that's the sin of disobedience. Everything else comes from that. All sin is rooted in disobedience. The apostles obviously placed great importance on the many areas of Christian maturity such as the fruit of the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, holiness and spirit, conduct, and appearance. You can read about that in Ephesians 5, 1 Thessalonians 4. Submission, proper use of Christian liberty, good works, doctrinal and spiritual maturity. The apostles emphasize all of these things. They emphasize all of these Christian maturity issues. Now, while, while a person can certainly obtain salvation without having understanding and without immediately experiencing all these Christian maturity issues, the apostles, they cast a certain doubt on the ability for them to maintain their salvation without a desire for a progressing and moving forward experience in God. Is anybody catching what I'm saying right here? All of these things that the apostles emphasize, none of them are, are to say that, that you can't obtain salvation without obtaining those things. But once you obtain salvation, it's going to be very difficult for you to maintain your salvation without progressing in God without reaching for the gifts of the Spirit, without beginning to exemplify the fruit of the Spirit, without holiness and spirit and conduct and appearance. The, the apostles taught us you can obtain salvation, but you're going to have to have something in you to maintain your salvation. And what that is is holiness. Somebody say holiness. Without which no man shall see the Lord. And tonight I want to try to give a, a biblical perspective. I want to kind of go heavy on Scripture tonight and, and, and bring out some points. And number one, holiness is an absolute requirement for Christians. Holiness is an absolute requirement for Christian people. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15. But as he which has called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written... Be ye holy, for I am holy. Now note this point tonight. He calls us to be holy, for he is holy. He said, I want you to be holy, because I am holy. And this further demonstrates the point that holiness is about identity and relationship with God. We are the bride of Christ. A husband wants his wife to identify with him. Amen? Normally, a husband chooses a wife whose nature, personality, conduct, dress, and appearance complements his own and vice versa. A wife chooses a husband based on these things. They choose someone who complements their personality. And we often see what happens when this does not happen. When someone chooses a mate based on maybe one thing, and they leave out all the other, 
we see the disastrous effects of that. Write this down if you're taking notes. Holiness is about appearance, action, and attitude. attitude appearance is how you look action is what you do behavior attitude is how you do it not one of the above but all of these not one of the above but all of these are important one who lacks a, who has appearance but lacks appropriate actions and attitude is incomplete amen it's like somebody who chooses a mate, chooses a wife or a husband based on appearance alone. They might look good. You cruising by the gym every day looking to see who's coming out the door. Who's all buffed up. Who's been in there toning it up. We got the appearance. If all you went in for was the appearance, there's a rude awakening around the corner, amen? Amen. The relationship is going to suffer. He or she can look handsome. He can look handsome, but if his actions are inappropriate, then there's going to be a problem. She may have the appearance, but her attitude is poor. There's going to be a problem. Her attitude may feed his actions or behavior. You follow out what I'm saying here? You have to have balance. As a church, we need to have the appearance that God wants us to have, but we also need to have the actions that God wants us to have and the attitude that God wants us to have as well. Because some people have appearance in the actions, but their attitude stinks. And nobody wants to have anything to do with them. That's where you hear all these terms, these high and mighty, these, these uh, people that are, so heavenly minded, they're old, no earthly good. Because they're, they're doing the right things, and they look the right way, but their attitude is wrong. God is no more pleased with that than he is with the other. And I am not in the slightest trying to de-emphasize the fact that your appearance needs to be right. It just so happens that we're going to have a couple of weeks on that, so I'm not getting into it that much tonight. The appearance... Actions and attitude are all equally important. On the other hand, as I was getting to there, even the case of having good action and good attitude, I'm just saying like this, it's hard to get used to ugly. Anybody ever met a homely person? Every hand in this room ought to be up right now. Y'all lying to yourself if you're not answering this question right. Because it don't matter how ugly you are, there's somebody uglier than you. If you hadn't found them yet, just keep looking. If you need help with it, come to me. I'll point some out for you. Ugly is hard to get used to, isn't it? I'll tell you a little story. I was in high school. I think I was probably in the 10th or 11th grade. And I went to high school at Pine Forest. And we were sitting out there with a bunch of people in this little area in front of the... Uh, from the cafeteria, and there was this young lady, and uh, it was pretty obvious to me what she was getting at, but she was just sitting there, she was sort of an acquaintance, you know, and she was one of these homely people I was talking about just a minute ago, but she was a nice person, and we were friends, I guess, so she asked me this question, she says, she says, Brock, if you had to choose and by the way, if anybody ever asks you a question that starts with that, if you had to choose, get ready. <laughs> There's a hook underneath that bait somewhere. If you had to choose between a girl who was pretty but had a good attitude and personality and a girl who was maybe not that pretty, but had a great attitude and personality, which one would you choose? Now, I'm sure she thought the answer was coming. She, I think she had it figured out. But she was sadly surprised when I said, well, I'm going to have to be honest with you. I ain't going to choose neither one of them. And she said, what do you mean? 
I said, because I, I think I'll just have to hold out for the good-looking one with the good attitude and personality. <laughs> because ugly is hard getting used to, isn't it? And you know what I think? I think if Jesus was sitting right beside me at that moment, he'd be saying, that's right, honey. He'd be saying, he's right, girl, because that's the way he feels about it. Oh, he's got off track again. <laughs> Jesus is the same way. Jesus is not settling for anything less. You live in ugly, guess what? He's not going to be happy with it. Jesus wants the whole package, honey. He wants your appearance to be right, but he wants your attitude and your actions to be on the same level. He's not looking for some unbalanced church when he comes. He's looking for the whole package to be in place. Some of y'all need to pick your lip up right now. Get back in the game here. This is what he says in Ephesians chapter 5, that he might present the church to himself, that might, he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. That don't sound to me like a God who's just kind of vague about what he wants, does it? That doesn't sound to me like a God who's just kind of, well, any old kind of church will do. Any old kind of walk with me will do. As long as you've got some kind of relationship, that'll be okay. That's not what the word indicates to me. What it indicates to me is one who we serve who is very specific in what he wants from his church. And what he wants is a glorious church. He wants a church not having spot nor wrinkle. And he adds these words, any such thing, meaning you care to elaborate yourself, go right ahead. He don't want nothing in that same category. He wants a church that is holy and without blemish. So God wants to identify with you. Holiness is an absolute requirement for you as a Christian because he cannot identify with you and he cannot relate to you until you get on the path of holiness. A father wants his family to identify with him. I sometimes listen to myself, and, and, and I'm hearing myself say the same things to my kids that my dad used to say to me. One of my boys will get out of line, and we'll get him in the room, and we'll just have them all locked up and ready to go. And we'll say things like, that's not how we act in this family. And my wife will say, Elijah, we don't do that. That's not how we act in this family. Juliana will go to doing her little thing. And right now, she's, she's doing quite a few of those little things. She'll go to doing it, and, and my wife will get on to it. We don't act like that. Jesus is the same way. We don't act like that in this family. What he says is this, be ye holy, for I am holy, and that's how we act in this family. Somebody say hallelujah on that one. Be holy, because I'm holy. That's how we act in this family. And as a church... We got to come to the point where we personalize that. He's a holy God. He wants me to live holy because that's how it, how it goes around here. That's how it goes in his family. The Bible says in Genesis 1 and 27 that we are made in the image of God. He made you to look like him. Sin has changed that image. We no longer look like him. It's through holiness that we get ourselves back to the place that we identify with him again. Holiness is the path home. Holiness is how we get ourselves back to that place where he can be in communion with us like he originally wanted to be. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. I believe it's very clear that holiness is an absolute requirement for Christians. If you checked in to this party and you felt like you can just come to the show and that's all you want to do and you're not interested in a holiness lifestyle, then I'm going to have to let you know. You can hang out on the, at the party on the front deck here, but when the train takes off, you ain't going, honey. When this train leaves, you're going to have to have more than just this, this outdoor experience. 
When the train leaves, you're going to have to have more than just, I came on Sunday morning and enjoyed the splendor of the music and the worship and the atmosphere of somebody else's anointing. When the train leaves, you're going to have to be living holy. We, as a church, are going to have to live holy because it is a biblical absolute. Amen. Number two, holiness must involve separation from the world. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 17. Wherefore come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you. This goes back to the point I previously made. The father wants to identify with his family. And ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, going into verse 1 of chapter 7, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Holiness must involve separation from the world. Remember this. He brought us out of darkness. But he didn't just bring us out of darkness. He brought us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Brother, Brother Nelson preached it a couple of weeks ago. I even referenced it last weekend. We are not just withdrawn from something. We are being drawn unto something. He brought us out of darkness into his marvelous light. He brought us out to bring us in. He's not just bringing us out of the world to let us keep living like the world. He's brought us out of something so he can put us uh, into something. And he is not, through holiness, God is not just withdrawing you from something. We are being drawn unto something. Sometimes I wish some folks could get a proper perception about how powerful the church is. Because church is so much more than lights and chandeliers and, and a pretty foyer and, and, and pictures on the wall and, and singers and music. Church is so much more than that. Church is so powerful because church is supposed to be different. Church is supposed to be the one place in town that you can come that will change your life. Church is supposed to be a place of power, of strength, of fellowship, that every time you come in the door because of the combined individual anointing and relationships with God that you have, you are going to feel like I am a part of something here. When we don't feel like we're a part of something, we begin to step away from it. And many people become disenchanted with their walk with God because they, they think they have a walk with God. They've never became a part of something. They received the Holy Ghost. They came to church. They started hanging around and doing this and that thing. And, and because they never got a real walk with God, they begin to get confused, and they begin to get disoriented and confused about different things. And the next thing you know, they, they came to church for three weeks, and then they stopped coming. Or they came to church for a month, and then you never hear from them again. Because the walk with God has to get deeper. And as a church, it is our role to compel people to come along with us as a church, to come along with us as a family, until those people can put roots down of their own. Through holiness is where those roots are going to come from. Let me move on here. Number three. Now, this right here is pretty strong, but I, I'm sorry. You're just going to have to live with it. God hates those who reject holiness. Now, that's tough right there. God hates those who reject holiness. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Verse 7, for God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. He therefore that despiseth, despiseth not man, but God, who also hath given unto us his Holy Spirit. Looking at 2 Peter chapter 2, there's quite a few scriptures in here. I'm going to move through these very quickly. Verse 1, but there were false prophets among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow the, their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. 
But these, as natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of the things that they understand not. It's dangerous when you speak evil of a walk with God that you have not yet understood. I don't care if you've been in church 30 years. If you don't understand it, you need to keep the... I find, personally, there's a lot of folks that are very vocal about church standards and holiness that have never spent time in the book themselves, that have never gone to the book and searched it out from themselves. As a matter of fact, what I do find is people that have gone and searched it out for themselves don't seem to have that much problem with it. Now, I didn't say that. It's here in the Word. Speak evil of the things that they understand not. And then it goes on to say, and shall utterly perish in their own corruption. It's dangerous to corrupt the Word of God. Verse 13, and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they that count it pleasure to ride in the daytime. Spots they are and blemishes. I don't think he's, he's pulling any punches here, church. Spots they are and blemishes. That's the same thing a little while ago he said he didn't want in the church, right? Spots and blemishes. Sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you. Sporting themselves with their own deceivings. They're happy about it. They're lost. They're happy about their confusion. They're happy about the deception that they've got going on. This is what the Bible's not saying it like this, but let me just say it like this to bring it together. This is a classic case of the blind leading the blind. Or you could say it like this, the dumb leading the blind. Because the Bible says they're talking about stuff they don't even understand. And they've got you joining in, having just a big old excited time in their deception. They think they're deceiving you, and they don't even understand what they're trying to deceive you about. And the Lord over here is saying things like they're going to perish in their own corruption. Having eyes full of adultery, and they and that cannot cease from sin. They cannot stop sinning. Beguiling unstable souls. Beguiling unstable souls. These are these people that hang around on the fringes of the church world and hang around on the fringes of this church. They're not solid in the book. They got ideas and perceptions that are not founded in the Word of God. They don't have a good relationship with their pastor. They certainly don't have a good relationship with the Lord, and they're constantly out there trying to find some Christian who seems to be weak. And you always find them cozied up to that one who's dealing with this issue and that issue. You don't never see them sitting by the prayer warrior in church. You don't never see them over there spending time with the pastor or the pastor's wife or the bishop. Or no, oh, no, you don't see that. They have no relationship with them. They're not on, a, on an acquaintance level. They're out somewhere on the fringe. You look at people in the church that are living for God, that are doing right, that are stable. You don't ever see these folks hanging around with them. These people who are pillars of the church, they've been around a long time. They always exhibit a good attitude. They're always at church. They're faithful in their attendance. They're faithful in their tithes. They're faithful in their prayer. They're faithful in the word. You know who they are, don't you? We all know who they are. They're sitting right here tonight. They're out here. You don't see these beguilers hanging around with them, do you? You don't see them cozied up to them like their bosom buddies. No, you always find these kind of people hanging around the ones that are weak, hanging around the ones that are not solid, hanging around the ones who are not deep in the word for themselves, and that's who they want to do, having eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin, beguiling the unstable souls. And heart they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children. Verse 17, listen to what the Lord says here. These are wells without waters. Mm. Clouds that are carried with a tempest. Is there any more dangerous in the desert than a well with no water in it? You can be walking up to that thing for a mile thinking that that's your hope, thinking that that's where your sustenance is coming from. You hear of stories of people in the Old West doing crazy things like thinking there was a river over the, next, over the next hill and throw out their canteen because they won't need that no more. 
and they get over there only to find that something has happened in nature and the river is dry and there's nothing but a sandy riverbed. Imagine yourself walking hundreds of yards to a well and you get to it and your faith is in it and your hope is in it and you reach over and look inside and the well is dry. I ain't even preaching. I'm just reading the Bible here. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness. Those that were clean escape from them who live in error. You see what this says? Those who were clean escape from them. Those who are living holy. Those who were sanctifying themselves. They escape from these kind of folks. Verse 19. While they promised them liberty... They themselves are the servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome of the same as he brought in bondage. Isn't it just like the devil to know what his future is and know what his end is and know what, that he has no power over God to be promising you freedom? These are where these kind of phrases come like this. Well, those holiness churches are living in bondage. You want to go to that church where they, they ask you to do all those things and dress a certain way and, and, and do these kind of things? That's bondage. That's just bondage. It's just like the devil. Got shackles on his hand and feet looking at you talking about, I can make you free. It's a deception, church. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world... Through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. We spoke about this last week. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it has happened unto them according to the true, to the, excuse me, the true proverb. The dog is turned to his own vomit again. And the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. That's rich in metaphorical imagery there, isn't it? The dog to its own vomit again. The animal that was once in the house being fed from the table. Now out there, back to its old. The sow that was brought in from the mud puddle, from the, from the hog mess pen, washed up, cleansed, now back out there again, wallowing in their filth. I think it's very clear that when it comes to those who reject holiness, God is not happy. God is not pleased. Now, you have to understand what I'm talking about here is not people who, who are learning it and not people who are trying to understand it. What I'm talking about here is people who just have an attitude that says, I'm not going to live holy, and I'm not going to be a part of this, and I'm going to try to take everybody down with me when I go. The Lord hates that. He rejects that. He comes against that. He calls it damnable heresies, and he says they're going to perish in their corruption. Let me make another final point here tonight. Number four, God demands an external witness of our internal holiness. God demands an external witness of our internal holiness. Romans 12 and chapter 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that it good and an acceptable and perfect will of God. Matthew 5 and 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. 1 Timothy chapter 5 and 24. Some men's sins are open beforehand, going before to judgment, and some men they follow after. Likewise also the good works of some are manifest beforehand, and they that are otherwise cannot be hid. In verse 25 in the, in the Amplified Bible, it says this, So also good deeds are evident and conspicuous, and even when they are not, 
They cannot remain hidden indefinitely. Good deeds are going to be found out. They can't be hidden. Even when they're not visible, a good deed is going to come out. It's not going to remain hidden indefinitely. I've never understood, church, why, why we as people, we're so willing, we're so flexible and compliant in other areas. But when it comes to living for God, we all of a sudden wax independent. We want to be recognized, we want to be distinguished in this world, but in the church we want to be anonymous. If you finish a college, you want a degree. If you finish a project at work, you want a certificate. If you reach a certain vocational standard, you want initials in the front or behind your name. If you give to a charitable organization, you want to be listed among the donors. If you volunteer for a community organization, you want a badge of honor. The list goes on. You want a name tag, a briefcase, a clipboard, and a secretary. But when you come to God, all of a sudden, this contagious infection of modesty comes over you. And it overtakes us. And all of a sudden, we want to start acting like we joined the CIA or something when we start coming to church. Everything else, we want to be all out in the front and in the open. We want everybody to know it. We, we come to God, we come to church, it's like all of a sudden we could join some clandestine agency. Nobody can know about it. And we, nobody can hear about it. We just want to keep it all private. God's not interest, interested in clandestine Christians. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to them that believe. Somebody hear what I'm saying here tonight? I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Lord is looking for somebody to stand up, stand out, and say, hey, this is who I am. Young people have to deal with this so much more sometimes, it seems, than the adults because in the school and in the youth age, young people are, are more vocal and, and sometimes they're just more cruel and unnatural that they would just say anything they want to say. They'll just come at you. They'll talk about you. They'll pick on you if you don't look right. They'll, they'll pick on you if you don't blend in. Anything that sticks out to them is going to draw attention and they're going to draw more attention to it themselves. But let me hear some young people that are going to say, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm not ashamed of the way I look. I'm not ashamed for the decisions to make about how I dress and conduct myself. I'm not ashamed. And when you're not ashamed, it's going to become power under you. Power. God wants his church to testify on the outside what's happening on the inside. As individuals and as a church, God wants his people to to look like on the outside and show what is going on on the inside. What's that little song we used to sing? Something on the inside, working on the outside. Oh, what a change in my life. Sometimes I fear we, we're changing the words of that. And it's something on the inside, hiding in the inside. We feel change in the church. Does anybody hear what I'm saying tonight? We feel change here. We're, we're pretty belligerent here. We're pretty free-willed here, aren't we? Because everybody here seems to be going along with the same program you are. But God is looking for a church that out in that world, among their own family, among their friends, among their coworkers, that are going to outwardly exhibit what is going on with this inward change that is being making? Now, I am a, a foremost advocate of the fact that holiness works from the inside out. But if your holiness ain't showing on the outside, there's a chance that something ain't right on the inside. And it don't take very long, church. It does not take very long for a new person in Christ to begin to mature to a place where some things start changing on the outside. It is just a veritable fact that when God begins to move in your spirit and begins to change things in your heart, it's going to show on the outside. God is looking for an outside example of what's going on on the inside. I said a moment ago my final point, but 
I overlooked one final point. Number five, we are not saved by works, but we are saved under works. What's that mean? That means that just because, number four, you got it down, that there's an outward witness to what's going on on the outside, just because you look holy doesn't mean you are holy. Just because you look holy doesn't mean that you're actually doing what God wants you to do. We are not saved because we look holy. We are saved to live holy. There's a difference there. We're not saved by works, so you can't just go to the mirror and get it all looking just right and say, I'm saved now. That's not the case here. That's not what God is teaching in the Word. He wants, when you look in your heart, something begin to happen that's going to gradually change that outside appearance, and there's never going back. There's no going back because you have bought into this. This is your relationship with God. It is your decision. We are not saved by works. We are saved unto works. Ephesians 2 and 8. For by grace are you saved through faith. And not that of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Titus 3 and 5. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs accordingly to the hope of eternal life. That is a faithful saying. And these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. We're not saved by our works. We're saved to do a work. We are saved unto works. James chapter 2, verse 14. What doth it profit my brethren? Though a man say he hath faith and have not works, can faith save him? If a brother or a sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and not one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding you give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. Quite a statement there. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled with saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed, imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. We're never going to be saved by our works. We are saved to do a work. We are saved unto works. God has called us for more than just to have the works. He wants us to have the faith as well. It is an inward and an outward process. Both have to be exhibited. There needs to be an inward change in our spirit and an outward change in our appearance and our conduct. Have you ever noticed that every church in Revelations chapter 2 that God says, I know thy works? They all have faith, all these churches, but God pronounces judgment and blessing on each church based on their works. I think there's some significance there. So holiness today is not a means of 
earning salvation, but a result of earning it. Holiness is not a means of earning salvation, but a result of earning salvation. He saved you. He saved you to a certain lifestyle. He saved you to a better way. He saved you to a more perfect way. He saved you so he could do something more with you. He saved you so he could make something out of us that was more than we ever were before. He didn't just save us to leave us. He didn't just teach us swim to let us drown. He brought us out to do more with us. Holiness is not the means by which we get saved. We cannot come to God and do everything that, that needs to be done so we can be saved. He's going to save us in whatever state we are in. Holiness is not a means of getting saved, but salve, holiness is a result of earning what he has put in us. When a father and a mother raise a child and that child grows up to honor his father and mother, that's earning what mom and dad put in them. And through holiness, you honor your God. Through holiness, you earn the salvation that your father has given you. Holiness, church, is the only way that you can thank God for what he's done for you on the cross. You can try to do it in other things. But in holiness is your worship. In holiness is your praise. In holiness is your lifestyle that he has asked us to live a good and acceptable and perfect lifestyle, a living sacrifice. That is the way that we can truly thank the Lord. Some way that we can by in any sense of the imagination begin to earn what he has done for us. Why don't we stand together right now? Someone clap your hands with the Lord. In Jude, we find him writing in verse 3, I wanted to write of our common salvation. But he said, I realized it was necessary for me to write to you of the faith which was once delivered to the saints. It's very specific in Greek. It was delivered once for all. We do not have an evolving gospel that needs to be updated with the latest theories of psychology and sociology and legality. But we have the faith which once for all was delivered to the saints. It saved people in the first century. It saves people in the 21st century.